All right. So let me click here and here. All right, and switch to the panel. All right, who wants to start? A lot of things to unpack. And maybe the first question we had at the beginning is, edge of what? Um, Shane, you, you talked about edge of your HPC system, right? And CJ talked about the edge of the world. No, not the world, but the edge of like attached by 5G. So just to make sure we are all on the same page here. Yeah, I'll, I'll start first. Um, yeah, I think that our use of edge is probably, in retrospect, of a bad choice because it has a connotation outside of NERSC, let's say, and it's different. Um, but yeah, we need, we mean, uh, when we talk about edge and spin, we just mean at the edge of the HPC system. So it's about um, things like services, databases, um, you know, workflow engines that maybe uh, have a different execution kind of environment they best operate in, and we put those in spin. But you may have the HPC jobs uh, interacting with those services. So it's to give those things a, a home in, inside NERSC. I think that with um, the evolution of uh, the system management stack and the integration of Kubernetes into the system management stack, that line may get blurred again. And you may see that you know, a, these persistent services are just another thing that are running on the system. Um, I think we still need to work through some details on that, but that's where the direction I see things going. Sounds good. Okay, so CJ, you want to comment on your edge, but I think it's clear, right? The five G tower and the imagery device, imaging device in a in a hospital and such. So I think that there, are, uh, if you take the five G example, um, there are. Uh, you you can um, well let me I'll answer it simply and then make it more complex from there. Um, you could look at essentially uh, what's cloud native, what's done it, at the center, and then anything not done there could be the edge, right? And maybe that's a little closer to what you're thinking, chain. Like it's it's further out from there. Um, then there's a question of you know what how extreme are you going to consider the edge? Um, you can have a system that's uh, at the base of a cell tower, and uh, that you need some pretty serious horsepower there for what's going on. Um, or you may have, uh, we're talking to a number of different customers who are essentially putting uh, a, a system uh, that you know is like a DDX2 system or something that has uh, a lot of horsepower at each scientific instrument. Uh, and the purpose of that is that you're taking in the data that's coming in and giving potentially immediate feedback and control to what's happening during an experiment during the uh, you know for the collection uh, if you have uh, as an example if, if you have a drone that's going and looking doing a search and rescue for example um, if you create a model for hey uh, here's a model that's really good at identifying the person that we're looking for um, you could go from just generically looking at faces and sending back face information to uh, pushing something out into the drone right at the edge that's really good at finding that person um, that's lost. Or, you know, they were wearing a red jacket, so only look for people with a red jacket or, you know, whatever. Um, uh, and so uh, you can have that base station, but you can also have other things that are sort of even further out at the edge that are even smaller. Um, that may also have some smarts. Um, and I, I think one of the cool things, uh, just to go in a different direction, is that when you have a common programming model across the whole spectrum from what you run back in the data center to where you run it something that's closer to a base station that's near where some of the action is happening and all the way out into the Internet of Thing in your toaster or your drone or your camera or, or you know that's that's uh, right there or that's at your you know the way a lot of 5G works is um, 
you'll do some initial connect collection and pre-processing and then send that back to more of a base station. Uh, that there can be many uh, stages of that. And having a consistent programming model where you can move the computation as appropriate up and down that whole pipeline, that kind of gets interesting. Yep, Shane. Yeah, just um, I wanted to mention also, we, we see um, examples, I think, close to what CJ is talking about too. So NERSC has this effort that we're trying to push called uh, the Super Facility Project, where we kind of combine, you know, some user facility that maybe operates instruments like a light source, for example, with, uh, you know, an HPC system. And so the idea there is that maybe there's a level of analysis they need to do that exceeds, you know, what they can do locally. But I think still we need this mixture of, you know, what what things should be close to that instrument to perhaps do some level of data reduction or, you know, compaction or something like that so that it can stream that efficiently to the HPC center and where then this larger analysis perhaps happens. So I think you can see a combination of these, these models as well. You know, and I think the potential role of containers in all of this is, uh, you know, it gives an easy way to kind of package up the different pieces of that um, analysis and distribute it out to the different components. And, and that's where I think orchestration has an important role to play because <clears throat> particularly as you deal with distributed systems, uh, it's it's not one monolithic thing under one control. And what a user means is defined differently all across that spectrum. Uh, what access rights they have, um, what kind of equipment they're running on, uh, how they need to be provisioned, uh, whether they whether and the degree to which they need to coordinate with one another. You know, maybe at a, if there's sort of middle stage, maybe you want a cluster, maybe you're running a slurb on that. And whereas you have a bunch of really dinky little endpoints that are, you know, as small of an endpoint as they can possibly be because they're in your toaster um, or your, you know, smart home, whatever device. Um, and having a way to, oh, you know, that guy went down, let's reboot him. Uh, he stopped talking. Um, and being able to push uh, the smarts too of like, you know, you you don't want your home device to start talking to uh, somebody's car that's driving by and start taking downloads from it. You don't want that, right? Uh, you want a secure way to authenticate uh, as you initialize a device who it should talk to and who it's going to trust and having that root of trust and then having an appropriate way to work all the way back up the orchestration chain as to whatever it is that they need to deal with for updates, sharing encrypted information, um, getting signed containers, whatever it might be. But yeah. is it something that we, that's our turf to discuss here? I mean, I, I, of course, it's the source of information for computation that we are um, going to run or that, that we, we used to run or that we, we are actually running. But um, I'm wondering, is it something that, that is more the cloud world or more Kubernetes at the edge than our normal HPC things? I have an opinion, but maybe I'll let others talk first. Okay. Then, well, no, um, go ahead. So then we can count. No. <laughs> yeah, then go rip it apart. Throw tomatoes. Great. Excellent. Um, <laughs> so in, in the last session, uh, we had a fair bit of discussion about, hey, what's the right role of scheduler versus orchestration? How do they work together? How, you know, what are their respective roles? Do they need to know about each other? Uh, and how do you manage, uh, we, we talked for a while about uh, the, the different notions of users and their appropriate rights and apples for doing different things and how does one guy act as, you know, do you have a non-user that acts in proxy for other different kinds of things? So those issues, which I think are very much central to our uh, high performance computing environments, the, the traditional mod sim types of stuff, the data center types of stuff that we're working, I think are all still present and just sort of uh, richer um, because there are more different dimensions being presented out in these distributed edge systems. So uh, I think it's going to get increasingly difficult to color inside the lines and say, oh, oh no, I, I only care about this um, because we 
uh, from the HPC community, if you believe that we are good at um, having expertise of learning quickly and learning new things quickly and designing things with appropriate discipline as engineers who are making engineering trade-offs, I think we have something to offer there. Um, and yet if we uh, insulate ourselves, plug our ears and say, no, no, I don't want to hear about those other kinds of problems that aren't what I've always been doing for the last 30 years with my big iron box, then I think we're shutting ourselves off to a great deal of innovation. And whatever solutions we do in our space um, need also to be uh, portable and extensible uh, and properly architected for those much uh, broader scenarios. That, that's what it is to be an architect, and, and that's what we should be good at. So that sounds great because you're talking about distributed systems, but that's a little different than HPC. It's much broader, right? There is obviously a history of trickle down for better and for worse with an HPC to the broader community, whether it's, you know, multi-core and many core or, you know, threading models, you, you name it, there's, there's a history of it. And maybe this will be the next iteration of it in the edge. Um, that being said, I don't want to spend forever worrying about the edge and missing the obvious with an HPC, which, yeah, is probably my first priority, right? Uh, to some of what Shane was talking about earlier with the super idea of a super facility, I think this is a really cool idea, and it really starts to blur that line of what is big iron and what is edge, because whether or not you're moving your computation closer to your input source or scientific tool or whatever you know, experimental facility you have, or moving the facility closer to the HPC is a matter of perspective, probably not you know, a physical one. So yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of that, whether that's you know, my satellite uplink or you know, the output to my simulation or um, you know, my 5G wireless network or something like that. But we still need, you know, we're still going to, these will continue to rely on sort of that heavy compute and, and the closer, the logical closeness is, is certainly something to consider more. I, I will agree with that. But what, what we also help with moving more to the edge and making sure that our workloads run on big iron, but also on smaller, smaller devices is that we lower the barrier of entry to run HPC or develop HPC um, things, right? If, if you have a, a cheap source of information like a Raspberry Pi or whatever, and you can run a container that you can also run on a, on a big iron when you, when you work on it, that's also something that can start as a science project at school and then you run it on Perlmutter someday. I'm optimistic. To, to, to a degree, I think that, you know, we all know that to get applications to run well on, on these systems, you, you have to do work to make them. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have portable performance just yet uh, for applications. You know, back to the original question, I think that there is kind of a role for, say, an HP Center, C Center to provide in this these examples. And, you know, that could extend even to say the networks that we're connected to. Um, so if you're trying to orchestrate from a data generator all the way to an HPC facility, um, you know, you need to think about all the different components that come into play there. But, you know, I think that there will be some parts that fall to say the instrument operator and they need to, to figure out some pieces of it, but we can all be working together, I think, to come up with those. I think that, you know, part of the reason there's maybe some disconnect here is like, you know, CJ or Barack are coming at it from a perspective of, you know, uh, hardware providers and uh, cloud providers and, and you know, or integrators uh, versus if I'm coming at it from an HPC center. And my, my goal is to make sure that I make that as productive for our users as possible. You know, so if, if there's an edge system out there that never interacts with us, then it's really not my problem to solve their their issues, right? But um, the moment that they say, oh, but we want to take parts of our workload or our data stream and, and send it to you guys, then it becomes, you know, now it's in my bailiwick. So, Shane, maybe t to you and to others, uh, just to try to follow up with that, I've witnessed uh, people who basically own the resources in HPC data centers getting excited about the notion of adding edge 
in order to increase the utilization of their data center. And they want to encourage more. They want the high quality data to be sent there. They want to deal with uh, federated data and to get more there. So are other people seeing that? I, I've seen, I have like four different examples or so where I see that happening. You know, I'll answer from nurse perspective, maybe Lucas could talk about it from CSCS, but you know, our goal is to accelerate science. So if one, you know, if that is making that instrument more productive than it otherwise would be, then that's a win, right? If it's um, enabling people to analyze, uh, you know, across a bunch of data sets, and the way we do that is to collect those all into a common location or something, you know, again, that's a win for science. So I think it's, it's all, um, you know, we're not, the growth is because we think by going and helping out that group, that's a new area that will accelerate uh, scientific uh, progress. I, I think from um, from our perspective, again, from HBC Data Center's perspective, that will bring to the table integration challenges. Because whatever is, is running out there, whether it's on the edge, whether it is uh, sensor networks, 5G, whatever, there are a number of software stacks that are already working and well established there. So most probably we will not be lucky, you know, by just getting clean data, you know, and, and that, so that we don't have to interact with any of those existing <coughs> software stacks. So integration in, uh, in, in my view will be the key. So to have the ability or to give the possibility to our users or such workflows to integrate their existing software stacks with the an HPC environment. And that's where orchestration comes in, that's where containers comes in. And uh, well, most of what we've been talking about the last three days, basically, you know, those are all these little details that, that create this uh, interesting palette of challenges. So I'll quickly follow up on that and agree with Lucas and say that, I think where this whole edge versus HPC thing really starts to get interesting is when we stop talking about moving data and we start talking about moving computation. Um, the idea that I may be moving a container towards the edge or towards my HPC center from the edge versus the data, that's I think where it gets interesting yep. and where this orchestration really starts to matter. Yeah, and that's where also HPC can, I think from our perspective, we can bring quite a bit to the table because we are used to look at the details of the different hardware you know, that are involved and, and to squeeze every bit of performance uh, uh, out of them. So yep. I think we will be able yes, to bring some benefit there and, and interesting feedback. Yeah, and as we discussed during the distribute session, if we can like use our spec and, and uh, make sure that you get the right image for your architecture and optimized one. I think that would be awesome. Cool. Um, anything else on the edge theme? Otherwise, we can move on, I think. So I, I might just uh, expand or uh, connect the dots to some of what we were talking about before as well. But um, I think that workflows. Uh, are going to have increasing importance and that workflows are going to get distributed around you know the, the to, to your point andrew uh the there's lots of different kinds of work that needs to get done in a workflow uh and that will become increasingly diverse and as that becomes increasingly diverse uh there will be a richer set of choices about uh where and how you want to get the work done um, I think that this will also lead uh, to some interesting opportunities for uh, disaggregation. Maybe I'm giving away my, some of the things that I would say that uh, we're, we're going to see as trends. Um, but I think we're going to see more disaggregation as um, the notion of I'm going to fire off work and I don't really care where it gets done. And particularly as a scientific developer, I'm not going to have the expertise nor the longevity or, you know, of, in touching this code to be able to continue to optimize that for all the different systems that it could run on. Um, and so 
machinery to be able to appropriately make the trade-offs of where should this particular stage get done and how is it going to get plumbed to everything else. And um, this is maybe a little less connected to, to this particular topic, but it's something that we're starting to look through is that when you start to bring together components that were never in conceived as being able to talk to each other, they have various different kinds of mismatches in terms of their APIs and data models and uh, data formats and lots of other different kinds of things um, that are a whole host of other things that also need to get um, uh, bridged. And I don't know what out of that whole morass is going to be particularly uh, relevant or interesting to the container and orchestration space, but I, I bet that there are going to be um, some parts of that that will at least need to know and understand those trends and where they're headed and what it is that we need to do um, and uh, be able to accommodate those, um, particularly when uh, the work could run anywhere uh, from on-prem to in the cloud to at the extreme edge. Uh, that's mm -hmm. Starbury Dragons. I, I think I, just to follow up on that, I think I'm glad you brought up workflows and how I think that um, I agree. I think that that is kind of the direction that we're starting to head in. Uh, I mean, we're already there to some degree, but I think it's going to become more pervasive. And so just as a, an example, the system after Perlmutter, the way um, DOE has kind of given us guidance on how to, you know, kind of direct this uh, next procurement is they said they're really telling us to focus on workflows. They're saying basically like, we don't need yet another, you know, simple, you know, just an exascale system that's really optimized for, you know, run a few hero apps at large scale. They're saying, think about it from a workflow standpoint. And so um, I, I think I, I agree with your point, CJ. I think that we're going to see maybe this is, you didn't use these exact words, but I think we may see more heterogeneity because different parts of the workflow may need, may work best on different types of systems or whatever are different mixtures of systems. And I think that um, th that it kind of moves the problem up a bit as to your point, like we want to be able to say like, here's something I need to run, find the best place to run it, you know, either right now, it, you, the scheduling jobs could get a lot more complex because you may be trying to make a decision of like, well, it can run faster if I wait for this other resource or should I run it now because I can get a quicker turnaround. I think there's just a lot of interesting uh, challenges that we'll have to work through as we start to kind of think of these as um, the pieces that we're trying to to accomplish. Okay, Eduardo. I have a question for Shane. That we're talking about workflows, and it's something that I've been like mostly hearing on conferences, not on production yet. But do the panel see that the way HPC is going to like? take CI, CD on doing performance benchmarks for applications? Because I, I've been thinking on what you just said, Chain, is like some applications will run better on X system or Y system, right? And let's say I'm a scientist with access to two or three systems. Uh, how cool would it be that I do a, like a git push for an application that I'm developing in the CI, CD system of my institution is going to benchmark, not fully run, but like benchmark my application and tell me as a scientist, oh, that application that you are running, uh, you better go for system X. You better go for system Y. Right? Like, do we as a panel see HPC take on CI, CD with benchmark, uh, we'll say like data to the scientist? You know, I think as far as like how this is solved is an open question, right? You think of like there's the from a more classic standpoint, you look at the Atlas li libraries for doing um, uh, linear algebra. They do these kind of auto tuning approaches where they kind of can benchmark how different different ways of decomposing things and then it can make that decision at runtime. I can see similar kind of higher level models that, you know, but they're not just at a chip level. They're really thinking about it, you know, different architectures or something. But I think this will keep the computer science people busy for the next decade as they try different approaches. And um, I suspect at first we'll see very naive, simplistic approaches of like, I know what I need, go run it here. 
and eventually it'll extend to like, you know, here's an application. I know it can run across any of these and here's different measurements of the cost for those. You, you tell me the best place for, you, you know, in your mind to run it. Uh, I, I think it'll be an evolving approach. Do we need to benchmark this or can we predict it by looking at the source code of this? Can we say, I don't need to actually run it? I mean, <laughs> I've heard decades of, of, of performance modeling kind of things and the, uh, you know, they write lots of papers. Um, but, you know, I think it's just hard, right? I think it's very hard to take an application. You have to run it to some degree to understand how it's going to behave. And even that can be very dynamic because, you know, it, anyway, it's, it's a really tough problem. Yeah, to take as an example, like uh, Todd was saying that they are using GitLab or also like Andrew said, like what if you have your GitLab running on top of two or three systems and you just want the CI to test that same application on the three systems and store somewhere some benchmark results, right? That 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 is what I'm like I'm yeah. picturing. Now yeah, I could imagine. see, you know, you run a couple of different inputs and then you get information across a range, right? Or something. What were you gonna say, Andrew? I was gonna say imagine feeding that and building a training deep neural network to make those decisions for you next time in the future. ML for system software orchestration. I think it's entirely real, you know, possible and a fun research area potentially. So and I guess also part of the of the discussion has to be like if I only run it once, then maybe I don't need to optimize it very much because I, I will only run it once and then forget about it. But if it this image ran for like 100 times and we predict that it will run much more, then we should throw some resources at it to optimize for different things. Right? I just called to mind uh, something that I alluded to in the talk, which is the, uh, the, the topology aware uh, selection and assignment thing. Um, that's an example of something that you can stick a wrapper around something, run it for just a little bit, or sample it while it runs, or whatever, and um, you know make decisions about the next run. And uh, I agree, Andrew. Like we're going to do what you just said in spades with ML. A lot of this stuff is, uh, you know, I, and I think the tricky bit is to figure out um, where. Can you can a user know enough about the characteristics of what needs to happen that you want to keep uh, AI like, out of the way uh, and not do any of that? Um, versus uh, where are you going to say you know usually it's like this, but sometimes it's completely different. Um, you know, and um, if you're going to try to say oh well I ran something with OpenFoam, well OpenFoam has you know how many hundred solvers, and just because one solver behaved in one way and one data set is zero indication of what's going to happen the next time. So you have to be really careful of that. Well, yeah. that just goes to introduce, you know, in situ analysis, right? If I'm running 10,000 simulations and one starts doing something interesting, maybe it's found an interesting feature in my simulation that I care about. I need to start to do more analysis on it or more simulations. It's where that NC2 aspect and all those are going to demand totally or, 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 or a bug. <laughs> or a bug. Well, is, I, I alluded That's... to this uh, I, in, uh, in the talk there, but I visited with some guys um, that are doing uh, microscopy at um, ORNL. And uh, very interesting that um, they had a particular case where uh, somebody had collected a run of data and then they sent it off to some scientist on the other side of the world. And uh, weeks later, the scientist got around to sort of finishing going through the rest of the data and said, oh my goodness, you got seven samples of something that was incredibly different, that's like groundbreaking science, but those seven samples are totally statistically insignificant. And that if you'd been able to sort of download the brain of that scientist as represented in a model to be able to say, that's reasonable, but it's different. Uh, you know, it's not like a busted measurement, right? Which is also another important case, um, which is another important case for, both of those are important for in situ. Um, so please go take a whole lot more samples and spend a lot more time and explore that space much more uh, and have that knowledge, uh, that sort of tribal knowledge, if you will, encoded in the model that you can do that in seconds. We're getting a lot of people, this is this is the key thing that we're hearing back from a lot of folks is that 
the time for these instruments is so expensive. Um, they're, they're, they take, you know, like one PhD guy a year and a half to go build the thing, and then 500 people around the world want to use it full time type deal. Um, that you really want to minimize the time that it takes to go back and get some initial feedback and know know what to do next. That is the super facility kind of value proposition. Is like, it, you know, if it's something you can just push to the edge, then yeah, they the the facilities should absolutely be doing that, right? Um, I think if it's a case where like you need large scale computing to answer to to let you know like was that run successful or not, um, that's where the super facility model kind of kicks in. I think that if it would be unrealistic if it's like, I need this supercomputer 100% of the time to support this instrument, then you've got, that, then that's an argument like, well, maybe it should just be at the, at the facility itself where the instrument is. But I think what we see in some cases is like 90% of the time they can handle it, they can do the rapid analysis on site, and then maybe we come in for those other 10% of the cases that they can't. A lot of the, a lot of high throughput computing has this exact problem, right? They spend most of their time building histograms and looking for needles in haystacks. And occasionally you find a potential needle and you got to go do a whole lot more investigation, simulation, uh, and, and experimentation based on those small narrow parameters that you just happen to discover. So I, yep, this is becoming more and more common, I think. All right. Cool. Anything more on the edge discussion? I think we, we covered it for like half an hour, so that should be good. And um, I would like to like we had this question I think in the in the channel as well. And I just wanted to get to Shane and Lucas to talk about their OpenStack and Spine um, systems. Is it something that you see as something that you need to do in order to have this? HPC um, sidecar services that you can run in Spin or in OpenStack, and that will evolve or that will, will will go away once you have the system where you can boot a node into either Slurm or Kubernetes. It's just something that you that you need to do now, or it's something that will still be around. You wanna go first, Lucas? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. So I. Um... The, the OpenStack, and I'm I'm talking about our particular case. The OpenStack has uh, very specific requirements, and again, it goes back to the I'm going back to the integration point. Existing workflows that rely on specific capabilities that we just cannot provide with uh, either containers or with the uh, with the HPC system itself. So, I certainly see that area. So that sidecar, if you wish, I think you use you use that word, increasing, right? Because that's where we can onboard additional workflows or additional use cases that uh, uh, traditionally we were not doing because we were focused on on batch-like systems, you know, on on, on big HPC uh, machines. So that will certainly. Uh, keep growing and I don't see that uh, going away anytime soon. Other than that, I would say that not only uh, it will grow in size, but it will grow in diversity. So OpenStack on its own will not cut it. But we have to add other things like Kubernetes, for example, as we are already doing and, and even things that we don't even yet know. So for for us and for Spin, so Spin was really um, to address kind of requirements that we couldn't really meet with our our current HPC system. So things that we want to be pretty persistent and robust. So you know you want those to be up as much of the time as possible um, because they might be supporting external users that are interacting with it. Another is. Um, could be some hardware kind of specific things like the type of storage they have, they need to back their service. Um, and then finally is sort of the management model, I think is the other big difference. So the way you wanna orchestrate these services is different than a traditional batch job. Now with Perlmutter and sort of Shasta bringing in the Kubernetes uh, capabilities, you, I think it, we can start to ask the question of like, well, what, what could we potentially run inside 
inside the system, especially if maybe the the uptimes can start to meet the levels that we would need. I think you could start to blur that line a little bit. So I, that's something I think we'll have to learn to see until we really have it on the floor and we've kind of experienced it. It's hard to know. Um, but I, I think the way that people interact with spend as uh, being able to orchestrate these services, we'll definitely want that. And I think that's we'll get some of that with the um, with Kubernetes being on the on the systems. But the purpose for the two systems like OpenStack at CSS and Spin at NERSC is is similar, but but your customers or your users, uh, Lucas, they want virtual machines and Shane, you, you were able to convince everyone to use containers and Kubernetes? Yeah, we kind of skipped the open stack virtual machine. We had virtual machine, you know, VMware on site, but it was used just to manage things in a fairly hand, you know, manual manner. Um, what we saw with, you know, Rancher and sort of containers is we could, we could see a model where we could let the users directly do that. Um, but, uh, and I don't think we've seen many cases where like the extra security or whatever you get from virtual machines has been critical to, you know, to the use cases. Yeah, I know okay. I would say was a, a similar a similar path. Uh, at the end of the day was a, a choice that uh, had to do maybe with the with the requirements of more users aligning towards that side. You know, it was not uh, uh, a selection for the, for a, a specific technology per se, but trying with a single installation to cover as much uh, as many users as possible, right? As many requirements, better said, as many requirements as possible. So uh, I would say that was the the approach at CSCS. Cool. All right. And um, maybe for uh, for all of you, but maybe first for Andrew, you said you you are not picking a winning runtime, which I think it's it's pretty cool because that's not something that we should do. But higher up the stack, where are you think we getting pickier, and where do we have very loose constraints? Uh, what do you mean by higher up the stack? Yeah, by when you, when we talk about the orchestration piece, I mean it seems like we go for Kubernetes and Slurm and some mix of those. Um, if we go with devices, how we interact with those, are we open to everything, or can we rule out things already, or can we shouldn't we rule out anything anyways? Like where are we certain we know at least the direction we are going, and where are we super uncertain what we need to do? I, I think everybody should make the best decision that makes sense for their site, right? Sometimes that may be one runtime over another. Um, I don't see a problem with that. Some have certain capabilities, uh, and and that's really useful. Uh, I think there's a, an importance to have these as research tools too to investigate new methods and models for container development. Um, in terms of you know what the right interface is between higher level services and orchestration, it's hard to say. Uh, you know I don't think it should be the Docker API or even the CLI. Um, admittedly, that has been useful. For instance, you know my use of Podman for unprivileged builds is based primarily off I can alias Podman to Docker, and my users have no idea. Um, they're they're already really happy with that, right? But so, but I don't think that's the right that that shouldn't be the right interface level to to say users or other orchestration services it, it should be more tightly integrated in terms of you know what what and where from a higher level i think that's a harder question from a lower level i'd really like to see sort of a true open source based you know uh, hardware uh, management library for containers um, to driver library management, where those sort of kernel to user space jumps happen, whether it's to enable an efficient, you know, efficient interconnect for MPI or enable some some new computational accelerator or something like that. Uh, I'd like to see that all happen in a standard interface that we could all collaborate on and multiple different runtimes could use. That seems that seems like a worthwhile community effort. 
Well, I could do a shameless plug there and talk about the special resource operator that I'm working on. Like, uh, you could run that with whatever container runtime underneath, and that is really just an interface to teach Kubernetes how to use special resources, right? Like RDMAs, FPGAs, InfiniBand, GPUs. So this is how M uh, NVIDIA built the GPU operator, uh, but we are trying to expand, expand that model, and we are working with InfiniBand, with RDMAs, with everything, so we can create a, an interface to teach Kubernetes how to use this with containers. And if you do this, Just you, know, for a you can you know plug in pieces as you need, right? So cool, Christian. I, I you know I'll speculate a little bit. I do. I am optimistic. Um, the, the broader kind of uh, container space is at least moving in a, a direction that's aligned with some of our interests. So I think that's very promising. You know, I think things like the unprivileged um, run times, like they just, they didn't care about it two or three years ago. And I think that they, for different reasons, they started seeing like, well, actually this is a useful thing. And I'm hoping that some of the other requirements that are pretty important to HPC, like um, access to devices or scalable launch, they'll probably encounter those too. And hopefully we can kind of arrive at a common set of uh, solutions. I think the value is the closer we can be to that community, it means that we're more able to quickly leverage the innovation that they're doing. And that's that's the main thing I would like to say. I would, I would prefer us to not have HPC runtimes I would, because I feel like it it sometimes creates a, a separation of us being able to you know take advantage of some of these things. Well, I, I'll build on that and say you know part of the reason we started caring about that is because certain runtimes in HPC popped up from a research standpoint to address that. You know, shout out to Charlie Cloud for really pushing some of this un, unprivileged aspects you know earlier on that are now catching on and making sense for potentially production container runtime. So I mentioned this really is just, you know, a first example of why we need to continue to have a diverse runtime ecosystem to enable exploration in this research space. And if all runtimes are plug and play and OCI compliant, then I mean, there's no shame in having multiple of those, right? There is a, a question from uh, Ivan and the, is it Ivan? Evo in the in the Slack channel. And I think we, we touched on it uh, yesterday, but it's worth uh, reiterating. He's asking, uh, not sure if it was already discussed, you know, do you see Kubernetes eventually addressing the needs of HPC or do you think something else alongside Kubernetes, Slurm, Flux, et cetera, will always be needed? So is it just a matter of time before Kubernetes becomes a bare metal scheduler in an HPC cluster? And I think, Eduardo, you will have your 2025 prediction again um, that Kubernetes will take over. And Shane yesterday said that this might happen in 2023, um, not in 2025. So maybe can you can we touch on this for like five minutes or so? Kubernetes takes over the world. I can jump in. So in terms of um, job schedulers, if we if we look at a slurm, it has multiple sets of features. There is the aspect of resource management and allocation. Then these tools also have a lot of accounting bits and pieces. They also have um, a number of workflow capabilities, which we use to stitch things together. Um, because these tools have been around with us for so long, we don't recognize that they do a bunch of different things. W what we see now is with not just with Kubernetes, but also, I guess, in general with cloud, we, we see a decomposition of these capabilities and then we're hooking them back together again. So, for example, in the, in the world of cloud, when you talk about Kubernetes and you talk about a disposable cluster, right? Think of it that way. You, you don't need to keep the cluster running um, for a long period of time, just waiting for workloads to show up. You, you can just get rid of the cluster. So then Kubernetes becomes your resource allocator at, at the data center scale. But then you have a bunch of HPC jobs that are still looking for Slurm or whatever, 
to do its workflow capabilities or to queue things up as as the as the workload is running or to you know create other threads and collect some other information with them and unless you put these two tools together kubernetes is completely um let's say unable to encapsulate an hpc workload so what we are seeing is a decomposition of capabilities of these tools and then rewiring them um, and people will do it in different ways um, you will see that the isv ecosystem will um, the software vendor ecosystem will also have to react to and catch up with some of these things um, as um, workloads and job schedulers eventually change so my prediction is yes kubernetes will take part of it over but we have a lot of work to do uh, to fill in the gaps. Uh, Kubernetes is not going to become a slur, for example. Yeah, I'll sort of follow up. I think um, I, I think Kubernetes as the management plane for systems, you know, we're already seeing that begin to happen. I could see that kind of taking over before it's over with. The question, it sort of gets to Barack's point, is like, how much is the user aware of it and interacting with that or not. And so I think that that line will start to shift over time. And so some you'll see some come in with um, workflows that are designed to work with Kubernetes and they'll want to use that. And there'll be a lot of H traditional HPC users that are like, I know how to write a Slurm submit script and I don't see a need to change that. So I could see that as an interface or something very close to that remaining for a long period of time. And then over time, you may see sort of to Bill's description of Argo yesterday, you know, maybe that shifts and it becomes something a little closer to a native um, kind of spec that can interact with Kubernetes and then eventually kind of get to a model where we're all kind of maybe interacting with the same ecosystem. Maybe the way we interact with it is, is you know, the interfaces that a given user uses might be a little different. Can we can we pin this down to to use cases? I mean, the first movers I think were like genomics, big data, machine learning because they're young, fresh, and have weird codes that no one wants to like install on a bare metal system and want to containerize because it was hard to to hurt the cats. Um, on the other hand, we have like the the big five codes from Los Alamos. I think like the the, the codes that are running for so long that. No one wants to containerize them because they just know how to run them without containers. Do we, is this something like, do we see first movers that won't go away from containers? And I think genomics might be one, or and do we see people who will take the longest to come to our like high performance container camp? I, I, I would say, I, I would second Shane there. I, I think that in its current forms, in its current form, it will not, take over everything it will have to evolve it will have to adapt you know so that uh, it will cover jobs batch jobs as we know it as we know them as we traditionally know them for many years and uh, only then we will be shifting towards that creating a slurm interface for legacy applications so that they can talk to kubernetes maybe you know something like that and uh, and I don't think it's a matter of uh, of specific use cases, but rather uh, uh, the normal evolution of tools, right? And and as the, the the lines between the two worlds, the HPC specific world and the and the cloud specific world, you know, keep uh, disappearing or continue to disappear, and we continue to merge both worlds together. Both sides will have to give something in. That's what I expect would happen. Yeah, something I want to touch on is the view of everyone on Kubernetes. And what I don't like is that we want Kubernetes to cover all the bases. And as, as I said yesterday in the orchestration segment, we should remember that Kubernetes is just a platform to orchestrate services. And like a slurm is a service, right? Like it's something that is there running. So we should be using Kubernetes for what it was designed for, to orchestrate and manage my services. So that, that's why in the yesterday segment I said, I, I do see Kubernetes becoming is just that system admin, that system B that will manage my Slurm or whatever service, right? Like 
I don't like that everyone just want to make Kubernetes do everything and like build plugins around Kubernetes and turn Kubernetes into a big monster. We should really think of Kubernetes as a system D and how can then I, with that system D, manage my SLRM services, right? And that's why like on the chat, I say, we should be really thinking of Kubernetes to live alongside SLORM. And because I do think of Kubernetes just as a system D, as the system admin, that, that will be there to help me, but I still I need something alongside Kubernetes to, to accomplish what I want to do on an HPC way. But, but I think that, yeah, you, you are right, but at the same time, there's a blurry line, right? You can write a YAML file to to run Slurm as a service within Kubernetes, but you can also create a CRD that feels more like an abstraction within Kubernetes, and and this runs your your Slurm service, and and mm. you go slowly deeper integrated with Kubernetes, and at the end, it's a Kubernetes thing, right? No, uh, where I disagree there is that you are saying deploying a Slurm mini clusters for every user. And this is long clusters will be deployed inside pods using container network interface and you are adding a lot of uh, layers on top of your application and that's not HPC, right? What we want is a long service running super tuned for whatever I'm going to use it and just Kubernetes being that interface for managing that Slurm service when I want to update my Slurm binaries when I want to tune my Slurm flags, when I want to do something. But if I start deploying a small clusters of Slurm with my Kubernetes, what I'm doing is the overhead that I'm adding to every cluster is like I'm removing the age from HPC, right? Like it's not high performance. So this is why I'm, I always want to talk to you on, we should remember that Kubernetes is just something to manage services, but please stop trying to grow Kubernetes into doing everything, right? I just, by example, uh, I argued strongly against ZN5 that I think it tried to be both a central processing unit and an accelerator that was trying to be both latency optimized and throughput optimized, and it tended to fail at both. Um, so uh, I agree with the separation of concerns uh, that it should we should understand and define what the role of orchestration is and let it be the best orchestration thing out there and let the resources that are dedicated towards making Kubernetes better be focused on the things, the places that is gonna add more, most value. But, there's a catch, um, I think that, uh, I don't know what it is, but I bet there are gonna be more things other than just schedulers. At least the notion of scheduling is gonna get richer than it is today. I don't know what else is gonna happen, but if you, ask for a five-year prediction, I'm not going to be at all surprised if there's some other layer. And so with the advent of greater and richer complexity uh, with all these different workflows, the number and kinds of different orchestration that are going to get required is only going to get richer. And so uh, what, a, what it is an orchestrator is going to have to do, in principle may not change that much, but in specifics, um, may potentially significantly expand. And I think a lot of the developments that we've seen with operators and device plugins and scheduler plugins and that kind of stuff are, are moved in really good solid architectural directions. Like let Kubernetes be what it is, but say, you know, and maybe you can offer a default implementation of some of those pluggable items, but let the innovators go innovate and let them do it better than Kubernetes itself needs to. I, I think we're all kind of dancing around this idea that there's there's a, a need for some new notion of a distributed operating system, right? And and sure, maybe we'll apply Eduardo's analysis that Kubernetes is system D. And I kind of like that idea. I, I would say that there's a, a very powerful aspect of treating container as the ba tr treating a container as a base, you know, si singleton that we now schedule or operate on. I think that I think Kubernetes has proven that's a really powerful thing, and maybe we need to start to redesign some of our other pieces of our now distributed operating system to also take that into account. However, let's not forget that System D and launching, 
my application in my terminal both rely on the same Linux scheduler and the same core you know, kernel components. And so if we're going to design some future distributed operating system, that has to that has to also hold true. So I don't think I don't think Kubernetes is the distributed operating system of the future. I think it may be a component to it. And systemd took over a lot of different things as well. So it was slowly eating everything up. So the connotation is <laughs> but yeah, no, I think you're 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 right, uh, Eduardo. I mean you're dancing around the schedule thing. Okay. Um, any other thought on uh, Kubernetes system D kernel thing? We got a lot of work to do. We really got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Where is Rocket, by the way? I, I just uh, saw some some Rocket slides. Rocket is gone. Do we? Is it somewhere? Yeah, it is end of life. I, they are going to store it in like the internet archive or something, just to leave there as a memory. But since CoreOS now was fully merged, like everything that was good from Rocket is now lives on Podman. So because yeah. are the same developers. I forgot about that. Yeah. OK, so and we are almost at the top of the hour. So do we have any like closing thoughts, predictions for next uh, year? And I think um, I see what we will get out of the split of like with Perlmutter and Chester with, with different uh, schedulers side by side. So what would, what is your prediction? And that's for all of the panelists. What's your prediction for the next year? And maybe beyond if you like, but the next year would be the first target and I will go around my shine um, my shine video so maybe Lucas do you want to start yeah I was afraid I was the first one yes uh, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I, I think that I will take a safe bet here uh, uh, and I will I will connect back on what Andrew said we have a lot of work to do that's for sure and uh, the most exciting part of the work that lays ahead of us is that we are going to learn a lot also we are going to see new things uh, new ways of working or new ways of deploying uh, traditional use cases use cases from the cloud that we never dreamed that would be running we could potentially be running on an hpc system and of course you know in this sense i i, I am biased you know i'm looking from an hpc data center perspective uh, that is that is what I expect. I, for me personally, I will keep an open mind and uh, be as connected as possible. You know, to, to not only to you guys but to the community in general to learn to learn as, as much as possible. I think that diversity in in what's laying ahead of us will be key. Okay, Shane, do you want to go next and ask your closing question as well? Yeah, so um, I think I've alluded to some of my predictions along the way. I think that um, we're going to start to see, uh, you know, for us with Perlmutter, we will start to have some real direct experience of like this marriage of, say, you know, a more containerized platform, Kubernetes management, you know, at least underneath the hood. Um, and then I think we'll start to see an evolution where users are interacting with that and some constrained ways at first, you know, if I had to predict, so my question uh, that I was gonna ask the panelists, but we could also extend to the audience is, you know, do we think there'll be a point in time where all applications, everything, all the, H, the jobs running on the system are containerized, whether a user knows it or not. Um, and I, it's possible we could get there pretty quickly because of that last, you know, caveat. Maybe they're running in a container that is the way we provide the the common runtime for all the users, right? So it's just there by default. I think that could happen pretty quickly. Um, but you know, how much they become a more direct uh, contributor or participant in that, I think that will increase over the you know the next uh, five years, maybe. So you might I could see in a five years from now where you know everybody's up interacting with a common orchestration substrate 
but maybe they're operating with it in different ways. You know, they're not necessarily all writing Kubernetes definitions. Maybe they're writing some other higher level thing that then gets passed down to them. Okay, Burak. Uh, my my answer to Shane's question is uh, yes as well. I I think the um, the reason why we are moving towards um, containers is exactly why um, NERSC built Shifter in the first place, which is users need to define the let's say the operating environment or the application environment. I, uh, Shane, I think you called it user defined images, right? That that's the term you used. So. And the, the, the wind that's uh, you know, pushing into the sails is um, now we have a lot of different ways we can use, we can access compute. So we could be accessing powerful workstations, we could be accessing um, a research center, we could be accessing the cloud, and you need to be able to push the work around. And today we even uh, introduced a new novel topic, which is maybe we want to push some of these to the edge. So I, I guess, this is the best tool we have at the moment um, to uh, abstract that software movement um, as the workload moves from one place to another, rather than the data moving around. So uh, I say yes, and I, I agree with Shane. I, I think it will go under the hood and we will stop talking about the container because it'll just be there. Okay, CJ, Andrew, Eduardo, in this order, maybe your closing thought, and then we wrap it up. So I just take a, I don't have much more to add about containers. I think it's been wisely spoken. Um, just to re echo, I think workloads are going to get more dominant, and distribution and aggregation will become more mainstream. And as a consequence, there'll be more need for richer orchestration and a layering. Uh, of a well-architected uh, facility for plugging in uh, specialized functionality. I, I think I already answered a lot of Shane's question before, and obviously I think yes. I think we're well on that path. Uh, short term, I think we're going to see this with pre-exascale and exascale systems. And longer term, I think we got a whole lot more work to really fundamentally build on this notion, so. Yeah. Okay, and what, and and maybe as a closing, closing thought, like what is your prediction of what we are going to talk more about next year and less about? I think I clearly hear, like we will talk more about workflows. I think that we can all agree on next year. Maybe we will slightly talk less about the differences of runtimes maybe because it's, I think it converged to, okay, there are runtimes and you pick whatever is your runtime that you fancy. Um, maybe we talk about OCI hooks more and we talked about it already a lot, I think. Um, what else? Like building, I think it's still an open topic and distribution. I think we need to expand on that one and make sure that we cover it. Orchestration, as said, I think Kubernetes and workflows what else? What do you think? Um, the HPC specific stuff, of course, as well. Edge topic is interesting. Edge topic, yeah. Anyone else? No. All right, I think then we can call it a workshop series. So thanks everyone for attending the panel and contributing your videos and uh, listening to my annoying demands and and almost adhering to it. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for that. And um, yeah, I think there was a fun, fun workshop. Um, pretty nice for COVID times. And yeah, we will do the next one, hopefully not too, too late. Latest next year. And yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for tuning in. And thanks, thanks to all of you hey, for your time investment, especially you, Christian, for all that you did in bringing this together. This wouldn't have happened without you, and I think you've been very even-handed and very accommodating. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and great job on technically organizing all this. This has really worked um, really well, better than I expected, I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they Hey, guys. Very See nice. you. And thanks so much. Yeah.
Bye-bye. Later. Bye.